So hi, so this is Biohacking Joe Baines and I've got here Chris Chris McGlade, yeah, yeah. he's the uh, the northern monkey. The northern monkey. All right, northern monkey. Right, so Chris, tell us about your show, Forgiveness. So my show is about my father's murder. Uh, that was murdered in 2011, and uh, obviously it had a massive effect on my life. And uh, last year I was on stage the first Saturday of the Fringe. Playing with a packed room, the espionage, and all of a sudden I had a panic attack. And I didn't just walk off the stage, I fucking ran off the stage, ran out the venue, onto the bus, and when I got back to the gigs, I thought to myself, well, the shit that needs to be sorted. And I wrote this poem called Blood Beneath Your Nails, uh, which I actually closed my show with. And, uh, and it all just stemmed from there, really. I spent a year uh, writing it. Getting it ready. Only had five previews of it um, just before the finish started. Went absolutely fantastically well, standing ovations and stuff like this. And uh, since the show started at the City Cafe, uh, well, I'm having press every day. Wow. Some fantastic reviews, four stars, it's been called a masterclass in comedy and all this stuff. And uh, it's just the, the whole response has just completely blown me away, really. Absolutely. Uh, any any takeaways from any reactions from the audience? Uh, the reactions from the audience have been amazing. <laughs> um, people have been laughing and crying uh, in equal measure. Two nights ago, there was the, the whole audience at the end uh, were crying, but it was joyous crying. There were smiles on the faces, were like you know, uplifted crying. And everybody left like, on the same kind of like emotional, spiritual high. Uh, even 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 uh, one of the comedy critics from the telly that. I mean, these guys yeah, have seen it all. Right? Yeah. He said it was like, like it was life affirming, and it, you know, uh, you know, he ended up, and, and so did Steve Bennett from Joel, saying that they left like uh, uplifted, feeling uplifted. Which for me, I mean, listen, I'm a worker men's club comedian, Joel. Okay. And I'm used to the quick bang, 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 fucking style of comedy. Right? I can do the comedy circuit and all that, but, but this is amalgamated that kind of humour with like a talking head, and it's like a story about the father and his life. And so it's like for me, well, it's groundbreaking. No one's done ever done this before, and uh, and I'm extremely proud of it that it's worked so well. Because I, I've got to be honest with you, my ass was twitching when I was, <laughs> when I was like going into rehearsals for it. And uh, I didn't know how it was going to be received or, or anything really. And uh, I took a risk. And so far, the risk paid off. And, and how is your, have you noticed it or your reaction to it or your response to your show changing as, as you do it each time? Or? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, because I mean, like, like sometimes the audience is in hysterical laughing all the way through and crying. Like, and, and, and laughing and, and then like, like last night uh, the audience was like really quiet and they didn't laugh very much but they sat there all the way through it and then like and then it's like, a, like you, so it's got like two kinds of crowds you get like crowds that laugh all the way through and you get like listening crowds as well it's like, so, yeah it's like Jack and Holden you know, listen to the story and so yeah I mean and I've had I've had all kinds of people in there. I've had middle class people working class people I've had comedy critics here, I've had uh, people from uh, just newspapers doing, you know, not yeah. necessarily critics, black people, white people, Asian people. And what kind of responses do they give you, you know, when they're leaving? Uh, yeah, but it's just the same. I've had, I, did a, I did a preview in Middlesbrough, a lady came off from, from Bedfordshire, uh, her cousin had been murdered. Uh, she travelled 200 miles to see the show with her uh, husband or partner. Uh, she said that had set her on the road to forgiveness. There was a young chap who'd been in to see Constantine Kissing, a fabulous comedian. Um, Constantine, from his stage, <laughs> he's directing people to come to my gig. And he came along and he sat and he watched, and when he left, he said the act really resonated with me because my brother, my brother uh, committed suicide. And uh, he left like 
feeling uplifted. I've had people who have, who have like fallen out with loved ones, parents, not spoken to them for like four or five, six years, and now they may, after seeing the show, they want to kind of like go down the road of, of like striking up, you know, and, and picking up the pieces of their rela broken relationships and forgiving them. And it's just. I, I, to be honest, I don't know. I don't even know what I've what I've fucking written. <laughs> I just all I wanted to do was express how how I felt, how I've been feeling, how I feel. My decision to forgive Dad's killer, and that's just resonating or seems to be resonating with all kinds of people on different levels, different social backgrounds for different reasons. You know. So you have completely forgiven your yeah yeah. So if you were sitting here, you would just shake hands with him. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Have you heard of, because um, you know they've been analysing forgiveness under the microscope uh, in, in terms of a lab with all the electrodes? Alright. So there's this uh, program in America called 40 Years of Zen and to go in it, it costs 15,000 pounds. It's a five day, very intensive program. And basically some um, Silicon Valley entrepreneurs, they've been putting electrodes on people and uh, watching what's happening in the brain and they've been able to figure out when they they've been able to figure out they can spot when you've forgiven somebody or not because the chemistry or the or the wavelength sure. of the brain change uh, listen, i don't know about any of that, that fucking high for looking bullshit yeah right? and that's what it is for me that, all that is like some like like it's just a way of extorting extorting money for of course people. it is yeah but oh but all i know is right yeah this is this is this is what i know right and this is what I know. I mean, really know. Like in my heart, I know. Yeah. Okay. I could have got the bloke who who murdered my father, like seriously attacked in prison. Yeah. One source I'd only met once before. He was a mutual. He was a mutual friend of a friend of mine, right? And he was a serious, serious hombre. He was like a para paramilitary, right? And I had a phone call, and I'd only ever met him once briefly, and, I, and my, my friend, and his friend, my friend, had contacted him afterwards and told him. And he said, oh, you know, he phoned me so we can get this sorted in prison. Right? And I said, I don't want it. Right? And then uh, another guy uh, was up in the North East, and he said to me, Chris, yeah. I'll say this much to you, son. It's easier getting people into prison and he was getting them out of prison. And I knew exactly what he was saying. He was saying the same thing as this paramilitary from London, right? They basically could get somebody inside sticking me. And I said, I don't want it. So, okay. so how did you do it? Because, I mean, well, I can't, I can't really say that because it'll take it away from the show. Yeah. But my dad, my dad was of a very forgiving nature. Yeah. Right? And he had this big moment in his life. Where he forgave somebody, and and in the moment the police told me that my father had been murdered and how he'd been murdered, suddenly the black, the man, the guy that had, that had murdered my father became this man that my dad forgave, and I knew it, was, it would be what my dad wanted. That was part of the reason. Also, this guy, and I said this at the time on the news. I mean, yeah, my dad's life had been ending, yeah. but another life had been ending as well, right? because because this guy's now serving 18 years in prison. Although having said that, he was alcohol dependent, he was sleeping rough, so he would have carried on in that situation, he'd probably been dead by now anyway. So this, this my dad's uh, murder probably has saved his life. But I didn't want any more, I didn't want any more lives to be destroyed. And I was certain in my own mind that he wasn't going to take my life as well. And if I did, you see, I believe there's like two spirals in your life. You know, you got that, that spiral on the, on the positive thing going up, and you got the spiral on the negative thing going down. You get sucked into that, you get sucked into that uh, whirlwind that goes downwards. You get sucked into hate, aggression, resentment, revenge, violence. It'll fucking eat you away, man. And you'll you'll just keep going. Yeah, you'll, 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 you'll become a bit and everything else. Or you can decide to to rise above it, and you can 
attempt to try to go on that positive spiral up and think, well, hang on, this has happened, I can't do anything to reverse it, right? And put it behind us. This guy don't love it, I don't hate it. You know, he'll be 68 when he gets out of prison. Yeah. And he'll be 63, 64, right? I've often thought, you know, because this is how life works, isn't it? I actually feel the eventuality will be that I will come face to face with my last killer at some point. Yeah. At some point, right? And that's when I really find out. But I know in my heart that I, I already have. Because I wouldn't attack him. I wouldn't exact any like revenge on him. I wouldn't have any violence towards him. I don't know if I would shake his hand. But the thing is there that in my heart, I don't have any animosity towards him. You know I mean? And I don't. And that and that is basically what yeah. I suppose that is the essence of forgiveness, isn't it? Not having any animosity or bad feeling towards somebody yeah. when they have done you wrong. You know, I mean, you don't forget what they've done. Yeah. But the feeling. But it's but, it, but it's a, it's a, it's, a, it's another thing again, isn't it, to want to sort of like exact some kind of revenge on that person for what they've done to you, and I don't want that. How many more shows have you got left to do? Um, let me think. I've got tonight, yeah. which is the 17th. Wow. Okay. Oh, really? Yeah. yeah. So we've got tonight, and then we've got uh, all the way through next Sunday. So yeah. like eight, is it eight shows? Yeah. Eight shows. And then and it's been a journey for you from the beginning to the end, right? In terms uh, of well, it, I mean, the whole the whole process, really. The whole process since Dad was murdered has been a journey. I realise now that like, I cracked a joke on the day that the police told me that he'd been murdered in our conservatory. I cracked a middle joke on it. And really, when I think about it, if you were to say to me, when did you actually start to write this gig, right? Yeah. I actually started to write the gig on the day that I'd been told he was murdered. Right? Yeah. Only I didn't know that at that point, obviously. Yeah. And then it all kind of came with a sharp focus last year. When I ran off the stage, I had a panic attack. When I had, I'd already had some counselling with a homicide victim support group, and and um, there were a few sessions. But obviously, there's crap that I hadn't got rid of. And then I started to write forgiveness, and I was telling all my memories and everything, which was a difficult thing to do, but also an uplifting thing to do because that was really funny. You know, he was really, he was really funny man, very on PC, very warm-hearted. Yeah, wasn't bigger than any way, shape, or form. And, and and so that whole process carried on, really, it went in, in earnest from like last August. So it's been a massive journey of discovery for the last year. But like I say, when I think about it, it's been going on since 2000. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. And are you going to tour this or? Am I going to tour it? Well, you see, um, I had the, I had the head of ATG Theatres, which is the biggest theatre group in the country, came to see it on Tuesday. She absolutely loved it. She started to plug it around with promoters and big management companies and this and that. Um, there's a small theatre in London, the German theatre, the J E R M Y N, not the German theatre, but the German theatre in London, small, small maybe eight seat theatre. Uh, it looks as though there's a strong possibility going there. The guy has come forward saying that he wants to produce it. So I don't have any financial out there, which is fantastic. Uh, Julian Webber, my old director from Billy Elliot, he actually kind of copied up a bit of a boot camp at his house in Italy before the, the, the festival started. So he directed it and he said, you know, if we get a backer for this, it goes in the He said, I directed it probably. Because I wrote really, I wrote it like a two hour show. You know, yeah. um, but obviously you've got to turn it, turn it down for editing, don't you? Yeah, it's one hour, yeah. yeah. So, I mean, I'll just put all the things back in and mix things around and, you know, put things up. But I'll, I'll, in essence, about like an hour and 45, hour and 50 minutes. You know. um, so, I'm, I'm hoping, because I, I just think it, it's transcended comedy. I know that sounds terribly arty farty and it'll be all fucking ass, right? And I don't, yeah. I don't mean it to be that way. But the responses I've had from people from the moment that I started to preview. I'm, from the very first preview, I mean, people stood up and applauded for like a minute and a half. You know, I, I, had, like, in, I had five previews, and, and of those five previews, I had three standing ovations. 
I've had people coming out and saying it's changed their life. I've had people coming out and saying, you know, I've changed the way I think. I feel more tolerant than this and that and the other. And so, like, when you get that kind of response, you think, well, hang on. This should be, like, taken out on a bigger level. Like, bigger stage. On yeah. a bigger stage. Yeah, you know? that's right. I would, it'd be great to tour this around the UK. Well, it, it's, but the thing is that I've had people, I've had people, um, I, so I wrote, a, I wrote a poem for last year's uh, show, to close last year's show, called The Right to Hate. Last year's show was about what I see as working class people being discriminated against. And I, I wrote a show, I wrote a poem called The Right to Hate, and, and I recorded it in October outside of the Blast Furnace in Oakcar where I live. Blast Furnace is all closed down, shut down. And um, I'm basically, it had about maybe 2,000 hits up until the start of July. Yeah. And then I was coming back from I was coming back from London doing this radio interview and somebody texted me and said, you better have a look and see what's going on. Because it started to what they call shift on over. And now it's had about over a, well, well over a million hits or a million and a half. Is this the one you had in Espionage in that cellar? Yes. All oh, right, the, the, the one I came to see. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. That's and so, cool. and, but that's, that's had now over like a million hits. Probably a million and a half, it's, it's all over the place. So I've had like people from America, Canada, Australia, New Zealand, Europe, all over this country saying, when are you going to come to tour? When are you going to come to tour? Bill Hicks, his old manager, yeah. friended me on Facebook, and he sent me a message saying, when are you going to, uh, you should put this in, you should put forgiveness on a tour of the American campuses. Yeah, I think and, you should. And I said, and I said well, that's all right there, but at the end of the day, I've got two pennies to scratch my ass and I'm absolutely broke. And he said, yeah, well, that's the whole point of doing this. You wouldn't be broke if, if you did the tour. And I said to him, well, you organise the tour and I'll do it. So I'd like, I've had some interest, but listen, it's one of them, isn't it? Really? I've been in this business for 31 years yeah. and you get promised all kinds of stuff. Okay, know? yeah. But how many, bo- how many kicks in the balls have I had? Millions. Right. And, and if things develop and if they come off, well, fine. And if they don't, well, we don't. Yeah. Well, I'm philosophical about it now. I'm yeah. too long in the tour to start getting excited and all shit, you know. You've had a great time doing this. I've had, a, I've had full rooms every night, apart from my first night. Yeah, well, my first night was the Thursday, and my first of August, I had eight people in, but I had like, two, two journalists in that day. Friday night, I had nobody in. And then from the Saturday, I was on full rooms right the way through uh, the festival. And I mean, now, I mean, I kind of see myself as being a bit of a working class Trojan horse, right? Because <laughs> I've been invited. We got, last night, on last night's gig, there was a guy from Mervyn Stutter's Pick of the Fringe. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. And so he, this guy approached me and he said, We'd like you to do Mervyn Stutter's Pick of the Fringe, which apparently is the Royal Variety yeah, performance of the, of the Fringe. And so, and I don't think, I don't know, I don't know, but I wouldn't, I wouldn't suspect there'd be too many people from the Free Fringe going on that gig. No. Well, that one is uh, where they come to you rather than you going to them. Yeah. Uh, so he sends his people out uh, to, to, to look at other comics and then invite them in. Yeah, but it's not, apparently it's not just comedians, it's like, it's like uh, theatre people, yeah, circus it, yeah. people. But, but he vets them very carefully. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So, so, that, so anyway, I've been invited on that uh, yeah. part of next week, I think. Which, for me, as I say, it's... I mean, listen, let's not, let's not read about the bush, right? The Edinburgh Festival is a middle-class arts festival. That's what it is, yeah. right? And uh, in my background is the working men's clubs. <laughs> Of the North East, right? Yeah. Um, and for me, to be invited on Mervyn Studders Pick of the Fringe at probably the most prestigious venue <laughs> in the Fringe, right? Probably, yeah. With a load of probably ticketed acts. Yeah. It's a massive thing. Like I say, I'm, I'm, I am that working class Trojan horse. Right? Well, for me, Edinburgh is like a university. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Without, yeah, yeah. without a shadow of a doubt, you know, it's middle class students walking around on stilts, isn't it? Yeah, that's it, yeah. And, uh, but I, I mean, listen, I mean, I might not have that education. I mean, I, I might not have the same level of education, but fuck me, I've got modern 
more, more, yeah. more, more, more intelligence and, and understanding and, and, and experience. And experience. Yeah, life yeah, experience, yeah. that's yeah. another one. You see, yeah. you've got to live a life, haven't you? You see a lot of comedians on the circuit who go on and about stuff. Yeah, but they've had no life experience. Yeah. Get out there and live a life. And I, what I would say to any uh, comedian on, on that, on this Edinburgh circuit or, or, or that, that, that middle class liberal dominated comedy circuit in London or around the country, Stretch yourselves. Yeah. Don't just play with that kind of audience. Go to a working men's club and send me a fair on, on a working men's club on a Saturday when you finish when these people finish work in, in, in industry or whatever and, and they go there, you know, what they play being go on, go on, I have been to <laughs> I've shit. been booed off. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Get so, off your shit! So, so I've had all that joy, you know, I, I'm still having it. I died of my arse in Hartlepool just before I came here. It was fucking horrendous. <laughs> and I'm used to playing them, you know. All but, right. but what I'm saying is, you see, to be, to, to be a comedian, for me, it isn't about just playing one kind of demographic, one kind oh, of yeah, social. Oh yeah, yeah, you should be able to you're do it. You're going to be out there doing it all. Yeah. You know, go, play, go, yes. go play with as many rooms as you can, to as many different audiences as you can, in as many different ways. I'm not saying about dialogue material. Just yeah. work out another another way to present it, yeah. and that's what and that's all I'm for the last 10, 20 years, and that's what I've been doing is pre pre presenting the acts, presenting the material in different ways. <laughs> <laughs> now listen, remember that <laughs> you must support this man, right? He's doing great things. He's a lovely lad. He's a great comedian for all my gob right? And I like him. <laughs> from yeah. that one, he's not. He's called. He's called Joe. Nissan Baines. Nissan, he's the main dealer. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Brilliant. Peace, right. man. Peace. Peace. Thank you very, very much. much. Yeah.